Hey everyone, welcome back to the Overmatch Podcast. Um, I'm your host, Kevin. And today, uh, I'm sitting down with prosecutor Jennifer. So Jennifer did some training with us last year, and she is a prosecutor. And uh, welcome to the podcast, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. There's a little background noise here, but it's because we're in a coffee shop in South Carolina. But uh, we've been trying to make this happen for a while. And Kirsten was supposed to do it because she has a background with some of this uh, stuff you're going to talk about. But she is uh, violently ill right now. So we hope she gets better soon. So I had to jump in. And I this is a subject I know nothing about. So I should know more about it as a parent. So why don't you tell people what you do? So I am a prosecutor. I've been a prosecutor for a little over 10 years. Um, started in North Carolina handling domestic violence and sexual assault cases, but now I specialize in internet crimes against children. Okay. So, and that's why as a parent, you really should know. So if you're deciding whether or not to tune this out and go somewhere else, um, even though this is a tough subject to talk about and to listen to, I really think all parents should know what's out there because we, we, we as citizens, and I include myself in this a lot, we, we bury our head in the sand a little bit and we pretend these things don't happen. And there's violent crime all around us and we have an obligation to protect our children. And th- there's some horrific stuff out there. And we're not going to get too graphic about that stuff. So it's okay for kids to listen to this if people are in the car, right? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we're just going to go through, we're going to talk about your background and then some of the cases you're, you're, you're familiar with and kind of give some guidelines to parents that, that have kids growing up in this difficult time with, yeah. with, with social media and all that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having yeah. me. So let's go back. And where'd you, where'd you grow up? Uh, Wendell, North Carolina. The okay. booming metropolis of Wendell, North Carolina, just about 20 miles east of Raleigh. Okay, little little small town, huh? It is. It is. It's, <laughs> it's that, still I'm, a small town. It's been a small town my whole life. Yeah, Window. Yeah, Wendell. Oh. It's... Um, it's kind of in a triangle type area between Wendell, Nightdale, and Zebulon. Okay, um, it's it's yeah. a pretty small town. Nightdale has grown by leaps and bounds, where Wendell hasn't so much. <laughs> but they were bypassed it. <laughs> they um, tried to. And, and you were telling me before we started that you you've wanted to be a lawyer since you were eleven. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I had a friend in middle school who was in a really tough home situation, and I found out that there were some things happening in the home. And I told one of our teachers, and I came back in a couple of weeks, and that friend was gone. Um, what had happened was that she had been taken out of that home and placed in another home because of what was happening okay. in that house. And I felt really helpless yeah. uh, because I knew these things were happening, and there was nothing I could do about it. Yeah. And so I think at that time I realized I need to do something with my life that allows me to be somebody who can do something about it. Right. And um, I think a lot of times, you know, people people like me, right, veterans who fought in war, we get, we get all the recognition. And people like you who do that, law enforcement officers who do this every single freaking day, day in and day out, are, are so much more, uh, you, you don't get the gratitude that, that you're owed. And, and to do what you do, um, I couldn't do it, and, and it's very, very difficult, I'm sure. But God bless you, because you're protecting children, and you're, you're doing great work, and somebody has to do it, right? Because these monsters are out there. Yeah. Um, so, so good for you. Um, so once you graduate high school, yeah. what'd you do? I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm a diehard Tar Heel. Mm-hmm. Uh, here in Columbia in South Carolina, uh, they think that their university is Carolina. They are incorrect about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, UNC is the real Carolina, and I will die on that hill. <laughs> um, but I went to UNC Chapel Hill, graduated in 2011 or 2007 with a degree in political science. Mm-hmm. Um, went to Liberty University School of Law in Lynchburg, Virginia. Got my Juris Doctor degree in 2011. Mm-hmm. Uh, took the bar exam in North Carolina in 2011. Got licensed there, started practicing in March of 2012. I started law school in 2008, and so did a lot of people. So it was a little difficult to get a job once I graduated. Mm. And so I worked in a small law firm in North Carolina for a little while and then got a job in Haywood County near Asheville um, in December of 2012. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started as a prosecutor, and I never looked back. Did Did that one incident as a child pivot you in that direction? 
I think so. Isn't it crazy I, that, yeah, that one I, incident like that can pivot you? And you remember what it was, that, yeah. that moment that, that kind of sent you in that direction. Um, we spoke earlier. I, I, I think the um, there's a lack of really good f- role models for females out there. Um, and, and I wish there was more. I wish there was Me more, uh, you know, women like you that could talk to younger women and say, look, you can do this or this or this. That you're, not, you're not set on a path. You can pretty much do whatever you want in, yeah. in this day and age. Um, so a- after you took the bar exam and all that, and where did you work? I worked at a small law firm, yeah. um, just a small private blur- mm-hmm. a law firm. Um, and I did family law for a little while. So handling uncontested divorces, some mm-hmm. child custody stuff. I also did some child support cases, um, some abuse and neglect cases. And then I got offered the job in Waynesville as the domestic violence and sexual assault prosecutor in 2012, at the mm. end of 2012. Okay. And I loved that job. Did that you? Was my, that was Did my Did you feel like you were I helping people? Job. Yeah. 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 I can, I can count on one hand the number of lives that I know that I've saved in no. that job. Good for you. And I'm still close with one of them. Okay. Great. I still talk to her. And well, she's an amazing person. What, what would be, if there is such a thing, like a typical case? Um, there may not be a typical... With my internet crimes against children stuff no, now? No, I'm talking or about domestic, d- violence? domestic violence. There could be any number of things. Like, the minor cases would usually be a shove or a slap mm-hmm. um, or the offender throwing something at their partner. And most reports of domestic violence come from women. There are men who are victims of domestic violence. Most men don't report. There's a mm-hmm. big stigma for men because they believe that I'm supposed to be the strong one. I'm supposed to be the powerful one in the relationship. And sometimes that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. But most of the time we would have a female reporting Mm -hmm. and sometimes there would be visible injuries. Sometimes there wouldn't be. Um, We also would have things that would escalate up to a strangulation, which is one of the most deadly things that can occur in a violent relationship Mm -hmm. if a if an offender strangles their intimate partner they are 70 percent more likely to kill that partner there's something that we did called a fatality assessment or a fatality risk assessment and there are certain factors that would get you a certain number of points and at the end of it you could say this is how dangerous your situation is and one of those things that got a lot of points was strangulation and how do you how do you approach that right because like is that is that a felony if you it is in in, in, right, in you, North Carolina it is okay so you prosecute that guy right mm-hmm. and uh, let's say he does a little bit of time goes back and she takes him back which happens a lot right with domestic violence right statistically a woman will go back seven times before she leaves the relationship for good really homicide is the leading cause of pregnant women's deaths um, domestic violence kills more women worldwide than almost all diseases combined um, it. It is really dangerous. In, in, in a viral, violent relationship, the, the victim will be hit 35 times on average before they make the first report to law enforcement. Oh, my God. And one in three homicides of women are committed by a current or former intimate partner. 70% of those are committed after she leaves. So when the offender says, if you ever leave me, I'll kill you, they believe them. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a case several years ago in Raleigh of a man who killed his estranged wife, like went to an area called Cameron Village in Raleigh, very popular shopping center, went to a store where she was working, shot her, drove down the road, and called 911. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a story several years ago of a girl that was stabbed in broad daylight in a store in Chicago Mm -hmm. by her ex-boyfriend. So it's it's insidious. Domestic violence is insidious. Is alcohol and drugs generally involved? Or can be, but in my experience, alcohol and drugs don't cause domestic violence. They only make it worse. Okay. If you, if you were inclined to be violent, you're going to be violent whether you're sober or drunk. It just being mm-hmm. being drunk kind of takes away that part of your brain that says maybe I don't hit my girlfriend today. Mm. It, it doesn't. It. A person who is inclined to be violent is going to be violent no matter what. When you, you've you interviewed these people, right, these, these let's just say it because it, it's men, right? So let's, the, these men who do stuff like that, do they all have a common th- trait? Are they all, like, super insecure? Are they all 
Did they grow up? Did they learn it from their dad? You know what I mean? Was this a house they grew up in where the, their mom got beat and they just thought that was normal behavior? Not always. Mm -hmm. um, the most common trait that I would see, and I'm not qualified to diagnose anybody. No, it's okay. But In your opinion. But, <laughs> but narcissism is the biggest trait that right. I would see is that their needs supersede everyone else's. Mm -hmm. They have no empathy. And their for, control, yeah. their ability to control a situation supersedes everything else. Mm -hmm. And so if they feel like they're losing control over that victim, if they feel like they're losing control over their situation, they will lock down even tighter. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen cases where the survivor, because I, I hate the word victim, it survived, because especially for a lot of these women, they, they survived and they went through mm -hmm. really awful stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've had a case, um, or I've seen a case where the victim had um, boot print bruises on her thighs from where mm -hmm. he tried to break her legs to keep her from running. I mean, it was, it was horrific. The, uh, narcissists like that, a lot of times are horrible at home. But in public, they're really nice, and, oh, yeah. and people think they're great, right? Oh, and, yeah. and they think they're, and they're, they seem super confident, but they're super insecure behind everything, right? Um, that that's that's interesting, and that makes sense. Right? Narcissism is is a, a deeply under, misunderstood trait in it people, is. and some people have, maybe everybody have different levels of it, right? A right. little bit of it, like, but that 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 super narcissistic personality disorder is extremely dangerous mm -hmm. and um, hard to diagnose almost, right? Because they put up a facade where they people do. think they're, oh, they, and that's why some of these celebrities are, are freaking horrible in demand. We were talking about that earlier on because yeah. their public mm -hmm. image is, mm -hmm. is, uh, is, oh, they're great. Like, they're so nice and they're so generous, mm -hmm. but at home they're a freaking monster, right? Yeah. Um, I can see this is hard for you to talk about. It's hard for me to talk the, about it too. And the word narcissist is thrown around so much yeah. now, mm -hmm. and it's almost lost its true meaning. That yeah. there are there are very real people with these very real traits. And can you give me a couple narcissist. of traits just for people who don't know what narcissism so, is? So, um, sometimes what you'll see in a lot of um, people who care, can be characterized as narcissists, they will sh blame shift where nothing that ever happens to them is their fault. Mm -hmm. That everything is just somebody else's fault, so-and-so that did this to me. Which is why in a lot of these abusive relationships, at the beginning, when you're experiencing the love bombing phase, if the person's previous relationships come up, all of a sudden their ex-girlfriend is crazy. Mm -hmm. She's a psycho. Mm -hmm. That may may or may not be true, but you're only getting his perspective. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they will, they will victimize themselves and blame shift. Mm. And they will also be very possessive and be very jealous. Um, so if another person, another man texts their girlfriend, all of a sudden they're smashing their phone mm. or they want to know where you're going, what time you're going to be, be leaving, what time you're going to be getting back. Who's going to be there? What are you wearing? Mm -hmm. One of the most insidious parts of domestic violence that I've observed is financial abuse, where they will take the victim's debit card. They'll take their driver's license. They'll take their Social Security card. They'll have all of these things in their own wallet, so the victim can't spend her own money. Mm -hmm. And Why, How do women not... I know it's difficult, but how do they not walk away from that do they think they can change because correct me if i'm wrong narcissists really don't change that don't. often because they a don't see themselves as being wrong no a true right? narcissist has a very hard time yeah. changing because number one they don't think that they're doing yeah. anything wrong mm -hmm. and number two if it is a true personality disorder then it is going to take a lot of work to alter the parts of their personality that maybe are a little more dangerous and maybe are a little more antisocial. Um, but I always use the analogy of the frog in the boiling water. You know, if you drop a frog in a pot of boiling water, it's going to jump out immediately. Mm -hmm. But if you put it in a, a pot of cold water and slowly turn the heat up, well, yeah, it, it won't realize what's happening until it's too late. And that is how a lot of abusive relationships start and continue. Mm. 
they don't start. Nobody slaps their girlfriend on the first date. If mm -hmm. they did, they'd never go back. Yeah. But what they do is they send flowers to their work and they, I've never met anybody like you. You're so beautiful. I couldn't imagine my life without you. I can't believe it took me this long to find you. And then slowly they'll start asking, well, why are you wearing that? Shows a little much, don't you think? Mm. And it starts to become more and more. And then you'll hear the first time they call you stupid. The first time they say something mean about your family. The first time that they shove you or shut a door in your face or give you the silent treatment. These are all really manipulative tactics. Mm -hmm. And by that point, most of the time, these women are already hooked. Mm -hmm. And they will be in a position where they're like, but when it's good, it's so good. Mm -hmm. Because he's such a good person and he's such, and sometimes they'll already have a kid with them and they'll be like, but we have our kids and he's such a good dad, mm -hmm. but then he's so awful to you. Mm -hmm. And by that point, it's, it's so hard to leave. But you owe it to your kids not to have them grow up in that. You do. You're watch, and, watching this, right? And I think this would be an especially salient point <clears> for <throat> you to hear. They did a study several years ago where they did brain scans of children who grew up in violent homes mm. and they compared them to combat veterans and they're the same. Really? They are very similar because truly these children are growing up in war zones. I mean, mm -hmm. they're growing up. And a lot of the times I would have, especially survivors that I worked with that had kids that would, they'd be like, well, they never did it in front of the kids. Okay. But he yelled at you, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The kids can hear that. They can. Mm -hmm. And I, there was a case several years ago where the victims, I believe she was seven, seven year old daughter at the time, um, reported to law enforcement, daddy said he was going to kill mommy. Daddy was pointing a gun at mommy. Mm -hmm. There's a really famous 911 call. Um, I think the little girl that called her name was Lisa. Um, I, I, to this day, I've heard that 911 call probably 10 times and I sob every time mm -hmm. I hear it where she's calling because her dad or her stepdad, I believe mm -hmm. was being really like abusive to their mom, like just absolutely beating their mom. And then she was afraid for their, for her baby sister mm -hmm. and it is awful. Mm -hmm. And she actually grew up to become a domestic violence advocate. Good for her. Yeah, She's, I, she's an incredible woman. I, I, I tried to not sound like I'm, I'm judging people, right? When I say, why don't these women leave? Because I know it's much more complicated than that. It is. Um, but I, I don't know if there's advice. Like, there's places you can go. So, give me those statistics again. 35 times before they report. Statistically, they'll be, they'll be physically abused 35 times. And that's not even counting all the mental abuse that led mm -hmm. to the first, right? Yeah. Physical abuse. Um, what was the other statistic you told me that made one me... in three homicides and these these may not be current but this is yeah. this is mm -hmm. what I remember from when I was working in the area mm -hmm. of domestic violence but one in three homicides of women are committed by a current or former intimate partner All right. Um, and 70% of those are committed after she leaves so the time when a, when a woman leaves an abusive relationship is the most dangerous day of her life yeah. and most of them know that mm -hmm. and the problem is that a lot of these women don't have the support system to stay away from these relationships they don't mm -hmm. have family support because one of the things that their abuser has done probably successfully by this point is isolate them from family and friends mm -hmm. and that's how abuse thrives in darkness and in silence and in isolation mm -hmm. so these these survivors don't feel like they have any outlet because this person has successfully made themselves the only person in mm -hmm. this survivor's life but so let's say a, a, a guy hits his wife right and she calls 911, the cops come and they arrest him, right? And he's mm -hmm. gone. Um, ca can she feel secure that he's just not going to be back the next day? Or I, I would imagine they're very scared at that point because they've been manipulated physically and, and mm -hmm. mentally. And they, they know that because they called 911 and had him arrested, there's going to be hell to pay. Oh, yeah, he's going to be mad. Yeah. Yeah. They... Honestly, unfortunately, and I would tell this to the survivors that I worked with, a restraining order is a piece of paper. Yeah. It's a piece of paper in a lot of states with some teeth, but it's still a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And a bullet can get through a piece of paper. And mm -hmm. if, if you do not take steps to protect yourself, then you are in danger. And it's really sad that we live in a world where I have to tell a victim the onus is on you mm -hmm. to protect yourself, but it's, it, it is what it is. Yeah. I mean... 
I, I went to the In Violence Against Women International Conference for several years in a row when I was working on a grant, and there was a judge speaking, and one of the things that he said that stuck with me was, there's no such thing as high-risk behavior without there first being a threat. And I think that's an important thing to remember, is that, that these women would be safe if not for the person in their life that mm -hmm. wants to exercise that control mm. and believes that they are entitled to get that control and maintain that control by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, uh, financial abuse is really common. And so a lot of these women, they may or may not have jobs mm -hmm. because in the most severe situations, sometimes they're not even allowed to work. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes if they are allowed to work, that paycheck goes directly to the abuser. Right. I've seen that circumstance time and time again where as soon as they would bring the paycheck home, they would have to hand it over. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't even entitled to the money that they earned. And so if they're leaving, they're leaving with the clothes on their back. And a lot of people don't realize most domestic violence shelters, well, I won't say most, but a lot of domestic violence shelters don't accept pets. And animal abuse is pretty common in these relationships too. And they're afraid, I, I've had this dog since I was six, I can't mm -hmm. leave her. And they don't want to leave without their pets. They don't want to leave without their kids because they know that their kids might be in danger mm -hmm. because their abuser has said, if you ever leave me, you'll never see your kids again. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a case several years ago um, out west, a guy named Josh Powell. Um, he and his wife had split up, and there had been allegations of abuse. And one day he had a visitation with his sons, and he locked the door behind him when he went into the house so the social worker couldn't get in, and he proceeded to murder his two sons. Mm. And the house caught on fire. Mm. All of that is alleged because they were never able to really prove it, but those were the only three people in the yeah. house, and those two boys died. Mm. And it, I mean, and Susan Powell, the wife, has never been seen again. Mm. And so, I mean, it's, those are the kinds of things that they're really extreme situations because most domestic violence situations don't end that way in such a, like, huge blow up. Mm -hmm. But every one of them has the potential to mm -hmm. end that way. Um, yeah, so uh, advice, advice for women that might be listening to this right now and seeing some of those controlling mechanisms going you know getting put in place early on mm -hmm. and and kind of seeing where this might go reach out to whatever support system you had before he took it away from you mm -hmm. there is a website domesticviolenceshelters.org i believe it is um and there's also the national coalition against domestic violence there are all kinds of organizations mm -hmm. like in the wake county area in north carolina it's interact um there are any kind of any number of these organizations that it takes one phone call mm -hmm. and you can get into a shelter you can access legal aid to get a restraining order like i said it is a piece of paper but it is a piece of paper with some teeth mm -hmm. and there are consequences if if the abuser violates it mm -hmm. and it's important to take those steps to protect yourself and also i mean i'm somebody who I have a concealed handgun permit mm -hmm. I, I carry every day, mm -hmm. and I feel very comfortable with my gun, mm -hmm. I, and I feel very comfortable that if I had to protect myself, I could. You could, because I've seen you. You shot, you <laughs> shot me with some munition runs in I the did. course. You did many <laughs> times, I, I, but you did great. You did exactly the right thing. My, I tell my husband about it all the time, and I remind <laughs> him, I'm like, I need you to know that I shot Kevin Owens. And you I just did, need you to know that many that times, like five times. But I only you, shot once. Did you? I only shot once. Okay. And we talked about that because I was surprised that I only shot once. I have the video. I have to give it to you. I have it on my oh, phone still. Okay, I have cool. it on my phone still. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Because so, I remember I remember shooting and then I, I don't remember anything after that. Well, you were a little emotional, but you were pregnant at the time. So, I was six yes. weeks pregnant, yes. Yes, you were. <laughs> so, But you did great. And it was great to have you in the class because when, when we had scenarios stuff, and I would always be like, prosecutor what do you think and you'd yeah. be like oh no i think she's good or yeah. you know that was great that, i think there was yeah. only one that i was like yeah i think you might be going to jail <laughs> <laughs> you might be going to jail yeah it's important to know that but yeah uh, 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 uh restraining order is just a piece of paper so um i'm just gonna say it. get yourself a firearm get yourself a carry yeah. permit and learn how to use it because it, it is a great equalizer yeah. with human behavior is it more 
do you have more success nipping this stuff in the bud early rather than letting it get worse and worse and worse? Is the outcome generally worse if it's been going on for years? Or if you stop it early, is, is it easier for the guy to walk away? It, it, with, a lot depends on the guy. I guess. Because, mm-hmm. because stalking becomes really common in certain scenarios where they just can't let it go. Yeah. Um, what type of stalking? Like following you? Following and, them, installing GPS on their car, mm-hmm. um, just kind of like showing up where they work, mm. showing up where, you know, they're going to be hanging out. Um, there have been cases where they up, like downloaded an app to the victim's phone so that they could intercept their text messages mm. um, mm-hmm. and find out where they were going. They would hack mm. their emails, find out where they were going that Is this way. learned behavior or is this just something that's their personality? It, I think it's a little both. Yeah. I think it's a little of both. I mean, statistically, most people who experience abuse in their lives will not themselves become abusers. Mm. And so, in my opinion, a lot of times that's an excuse mm. because you have the opportunity to control your behavior unless mm-hmm. unless you have some kind of disorder that prevents that. Because there are people that have impulse disorders. There are people that have certain kinds of brain trauma. Mm. But that's not most people. Mm -hmm. Most people don't have that experience. Most people don't have those issues. Most people just say, well, this is how I am and decide that that's how they're going to live their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's a cop out. It's just, it's just a straight up cop out. And I think, I think family sometimes give that people that out to it. That's just how he is. You know what I mean? That's BS. That's complete BS. There's Um, a lot of enabling that happens in a lot of dysfunctional mm -hmm. family systems. Walk away, ladies. Walk away. Yes, one hundred percent. Just Get walk out. away. You deserve so much better. You do. Um, all right, moving on. Yeah. It, it, this is so hard to talk about. <laughs> However, it is important. Yeah. And thank you so much. Um, after you left that, and you went to the the kid stuff, the I don't know what to call it. Internet crimes against internet children. crimes against children, right? And having four kids, but they're they're grown now. I, I almost feel like I dodged a bullet because it yeah. wasn't that bad, especially when my kids were younger. Mm-hmm. And it it's always seems to be more against girls, right? What, yeah. what, what statistic did you give me? So, <sighs> it's particularly with what we call online enticement. So mm-hmm. when a child meets someone online um, and they start to go through the process of what we call grooming. I'm, I'm sorry, we call that, how did they meet them? Uh, Anywhere. They can meet them on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Discord, um, games that are designed to, uh, like games a, that are like ge- geared toward children, like Fortnite and Roblox. They really? have chat functions. Yeah. You can meet grown adult men that are on there looking for kids. Oh and I say grown God. adult men because in this field, the overwhelming majority of offenders are men. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We have a few female offenders that we deal with, but most of the time mm-hmm. it is it is men, and they're everywhere. I mean, they're everywhere. Any any social media application that you can think of, they are on there. So you you think that while my 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 fourteen year old daughter does not have Instagram or TikTok, she's safe, right? But she plays online games with her friends. There are weird criminal men trolling those things looking yes. oh my god i didn't yeah. think of that honestly yeah. like yeah. I, I didn't yeah. even and this is why this is so yeah. important um and people think they're protecting their kids because they don't have tiktok and, and stuff like which are horrible right yeah. um but online games like what's that minecraft right minecraft like, fortnite like, things like that yeah. really yeah oh my god um yeah. sorry go ahead I, no, I keep they, jumping in with questions <laughs> because no they for for the purposes of online enticement um the statistics from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children um, are that 78% of online enticement victims are girls. Mm-hmm. About 13% are boys, and for about 9%, they couldn't determine the gender of the child. Mm-hmm. But the the number of online enticement um, reports in 2020 increased by 97.5% from wow. previous years. 97? Oh, my God. Yeah. It's, and it's because there are so many different social media applications out there that it's almost impossible for parents to keep up. Mm-hmm. And a lot of parents have just been like, well, I just don't understand technology. You mm-hmm. know, I just don't get it. And at this point, in 2023, that's no excuse. Mm-hmm. You have to learn it. 
You have to mm. because your kids have grown up with it. Mm-hmm. I got my first AOL account when I was 10 years old. And I can guarantee you that I was in chat rooms probably talking to somebody that I had no business talking to. Mm-hmm. But back then, we didn't know. Nobody that was knew like 1995 yeah. when mm-hmm. AOL like first came out. Mm-hmm. You've we got mail. Know. You've got mail, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um. nobody knew that the internet really was kind of the Wild West back then, and it's a little worse now. Yeah. And nobody kind of realized what the internet was going to end up being used for. Yeah, yeah. And now you have all of these cases. There was a case recently um, that actually ended in North Carolina, ended in Davidson County, where a 13-year-old girl was alleged to have been kidnapped from her home in Texas and brought to the home of a 34-year-old man. And she was found locked in a shed. And she had met him online. I mean, it's... Yeah. People think that, you know... We as a society, we want to make an other of victims. We want to say, well, I would never do X activity that mm-hmm. would put me in a position to be victimized. That's really dangerous. Yeah. Because you have no idea the things that you do on a daily basis that could poten- potentially put you in danger. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, because I, I deal with online enticement, so the the people going online and looking for kids to send messages to to get explicit mm-hmm. content from, but I also deal with the explicit content end, where images and videos of children engaged in sexual activity with adults or other children. Mm. Um, in, in federal law, it's called child pornography. Um, we don't call it that. And in, in our common terms, we call it child sexual abuse material mm-hmm. uh, because that's what it depicts. It depicts mm-hmm. child sexual abuse. And, and there is no minimum age for that okay oh my god um i don't even know what to ask um what what what's the worst platform out there? <laughs> the worst platform it's hard to say because there are there are so many right now that are just unpoliced mm-hmm. like i hate tiktok just mm-hmm. personal opinion i hate tiktok mm-hmm. because there was a big controversy a year or two ago, I guess now, of a TikTok account that depicted a girl, I believe she was three, three or four, um, and a lot of videos of her eating a corn dog, her eating a pickle, her, um, they were just doing all of these other mm-hmm. things that would seemingly be innocent. <laughs> but most of the people saving these videos were men. Mm-hmm. Most of the people commenting on these videos were men. And they were commenting things like, little cutie, beautiful little girl. Some going as far as calling her sexy. And mm. it, the internet, people feel like they're behind a screen so they can get away with whatever they want. And so they'll say things that they would maybe potentially never say in person. Mm. And it's, it's awful. Like... It, Instagram is rough because you see, I mean, like I said, any social media platform that exists, child sexual abuse material is being exchanged on it Mm -hmm. and children are being enticed on it. All of them. Mm -hmm. But I would say the most common cyber tips that National Center for Missing and Exploited Children get are from the big kind of social media applications like Snapchat, Facebook, Mm -hmm. Instagram, and we've started seeing a sharp increase in TikTok. Mm-hmm. Kids can get on there and, and create an account and, uh, you know, they ask you your age, you just lie and move on, right? Yeah. Um, the, uh, w- without, we want to be careful we don't give anybody any kind of ideas of how you, how you catch these yeah. people because, um, can you, can you talk me about it? A typical case. Let's let's go there, right? Okay. Something that's not ongoing. That that in the past where somebody used one of these platforms to, to mm-hmm. yeah, God, I hate them. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children operates the Cyber Tip Line, and electronic service providers and internet service providers can report material they believe to be child sexual abuse material that's being traded or uploaded on their platforms. Mm -hmm. Um, So on an average case, we'll get a a cyber tip from, say, Snapchat. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they go by Snap Inc. is their actual corporate name. Um, And they'll say, you know, 
this is the IP address that uploaded the image. So it's in your it's in your jurisdiction. Yes. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. they'll they'll notify us. They'll say this is the IP address that uploaded. This is where we believe that, that IP address is located. Um, this is the image that was uploaded, and it'll give us a copy of mm -hmm. the image. Sometimes they review it. Sometimes they don't. Um, and then one of the investigators, most, I believe, if not all states, have an Internet Crimes Against Children task force, and those cyber tips generally go to that task force. And an investigator assigned to that task force will review that cyber tip, and it will go to the, the jurisdiction that it corresponds with. So say here in South Carolina, say it is a tip that goes to Richland County, uh, which is where Columbia is located, in the Richland County Sheriff's Office or Columbia Police Department, whatever municipality has jurisdiction there, will investigate. Um, they'll get the information from the electronic service provider, so they'll get the subscriber information for that IP address. And it'll usually have an a, a name and an address associated mm -hmm. with it. And then they'll do a little more investigation, figure out who lives at that address, and if they have enough, they'll do a search warrant. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times they'll seize devices. They will do search warrants to search those devices to see what they can find. And a lot of people would be surprised the things that mm -hmm. a good forensic examiner can find mm -hmm. on your phone. There's no such thing really as deleting most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, it goes away, but not forever necessarily. And so there are, there are obviously programs that we call anti-forensic tools, and sometimes having those on your phone is kind of a red flag for <laughs> these search right. warrants. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. If you have certain programs, they take note of that. Um, but there are certain search terms that they look for mm -hmm. that are commonly associated with child sexual abuse material. Mm -hmm. There are certain websites that are commonly associated with mm -hmm. online enticement of children. How often are you serving a search warrant and you go there and the guy's married with kids? A lot. And he's, yeah. A lot. And, uh, a lot. Does the wife know? Sometimes or, uh, yes, sometimes no. Yeah. Is there abuse to the kids in the house sometimes, sometimes yes sometimes no sometimes i guess yes, yeah sometimes, sometimes he's, no. he's living a, a freaking secondary life maybe mm -hmm. or yeah okay i don't know what to ask yeah. I'm, I'm like <laughs> shocked know, but I, yeah one of the um, things that um there was a survey done by the canadian center for child protection um and they said that 67 percent of survivors of child sexual abuse material um, and the distribution of it said that the distribution of that material affects them in a different way than the hands-on abuse did because that distribution doesn't end and that those images are permanent. There's no way, once it's out, it's out forever. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there's no way to pull that back. I mean, I've had people say, well, can't the government just shut that off? I would love to work myself out of a job. Mm -hmm. I would love to eradicate this completely. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately offenders are getting smarter and they are finding new ways to target kids and the things that parents think are really innocent maybe necessarily aren't Does one of the things example? like yeah. well so one of the things that i really hate is the first day of school posts that people do with like the little chalkboards of like my name is so and so my teacher's mm -hmm. name is this i go to this school i'm in this grade my favorite color is this because you are handing people so much information about your kids mm. and you don't need to. You can do those first day of school pictures and have, you know, you don't need all that information first of all, but, but you can have a post like that where you put kind of benign information that's not so specific and doesn't give offenders a way to get to your child. Mm -hmm. doesn't hand your child to a, an offender on the silver platter. I hate those posts and I get mm -hmm. so mad about them because I'm like... Would you would you advise parents just keep your kids off all your posts? Yeah. Is that an... Un yeah. I mean, why? Least, like, don't put their faces. There's yeah. something called digital kidnapping. Um, and it's not hugely common, but it does happen where they will take photos of your family and create their own profile and they will just live their own life. And as far as the internet is concerned, those are their kids. Like, oh. and, it's, and it's happened a few times. Yeah. And it's really scary to, to be the person who is charged with the responsibility of protecting your own child mm -hmm. and losing that. Just err on the side of caution and never yeah. post a picture of your kids. Yeah. And I can't say I, I've never you posted know? pictures of my son because I absolutely have. I'm mm -hmm. a first-time mom. He's seven months old well, yeah. almost. And, mm -hmm. you know, and he just started crawling for the first time. And, and most of my family lives all over the place. Yeah. We don't have any family mm -hmm. in South Carolina. Yeah. And so it, it's difficult. But I've, I get I've it. done it, mm -hmm. but I also, 
recognize that I keep my stuff as locked down as possible. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to protect my son as much as I can. And I know that we live in a world where he's going to grow up with the internet. Mm -hmm. He's going to grow up with social media and I just have to do my best to protect him. And what I see a lot of parents do is they want to give their kids too much privacy and they don't want to get in their kids' business. Mm -hmm. As a parent, it's your responsibility to be in their business, but be in their business with a reason. Mm -hmm. Don't just say, because I said so, because strict parents make sneaky kids. And so just saying, well, you're not getting a phone until you're 17 and that's that, Mm -hmm. is A, not reasonable, and B, doesn't explain to them why. Mm -hmm. Because kids don't want to believe that there there are people out in the world that are going to use these images for nefarious purposes. It's it, speaking from experience. It's a very difficult thing to, to explain yeah. to kids. Like we, we were like, our kids aren't getting phones. That's it. Yeah. But again, unreasonable when your daughter's going somewhere and you want to be able to figure out where she is and, yeah. and have instant contact with her. Um, it's, but you can lock down. There's some programs yeah. for locking the phone down, yeah. right? Do you have any recommendations on that? I don't know any specific programs, but I know that there are ways to kind of limit screen time, especially for younger kids. Mm-hmm. There are ways to make it so that they can't download an application without you approving it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are ways to monitor what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, like when, when I think I, there's an app called Bark, I think. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but I feel like there's an app like that that kind of will give you notifications if they're if your mm-hmm. kids are starting to edge towards something that's a little questionable. And I, I like when we gave, gave our daughters because my boys didn't even want a phone, but when we give our daughters phones, it was on the premise that we are tracking this phone mm-hmm. and we it's under our name and you can have a phone on the on the conditions that there's a tracker on it that we mm-hmm. always know where you are and we were upfront about it and we yeah. said okay we, we will play this game but we will keep control of it now i'm sure um we were in control of everything because it's almost impossible i mean your kids are at school but other yeah. kids with phones and, and looking at all kinds of stuff but yeah. it, you do what you can saying i understand technology is not an option for yeah. you as a parent these days a um, lot of parents don't re- realize that the first time i think the average age for children looking at pornography is something like 11 years old. Wow. Oh my and, God. And I mean, it's the, it is not hard to get to things mm-hmm. yeah. that kids have no business looking at. Is, I don't know, but I, I, I assume that's having a, an adverse effect on kids now that have been looking at that stuff since they yeah. were very young and yeah. are growing into men. You know, now I imagine that would be would ha- be having all kinds of adverse effects, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, th- there's been pedophiles around since the beginning of time, mm-hmm. right? Um, this, th- the internet didn't in- invent them. When I was in Fort Hood, Texas in 1998, I was leaving, we were going to Germany, and there was a, a sergeant, I was a sergeant, I was an E5, and there was a guy with me, and I really didn't know him, and uh, but we were both PCSing, they call it permanent change station somewhere else, right? And he was in the same company. So we end up going to turn our equipment in together. Mm-hmm. And we end up just a couple of places. Well, the, the first sergeant called me in and he was like, how well do you know Sergeant Blank? Uh, that's not his name. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I said, I really don't know him. We just end up doing this. And he said that the CID, the criminal investigation team, came here yesterday and interviewed him and he admitted to sexually assaulting a six-year-old girl. And... I was just blown away because this wasn't some creepy old man. It, you know, this was a 23 year old guy, yeah. right? Um, so, again, th- th- just because they're not some weirdo living in a shack in the woods yeah. doesn't mean they're not a, a pedophile and a yeah. predator, right? Yeah. And I'm sure that the cases you've, you've dealt with have all ages, right? Yeah. Um, the uh, and all different income levels and all mm-hmm. different education levels and yeah. um, so they're out there and you can't yeah. you can't tell what they're like. Um, okay, another case. So a few years ago, um, Jared Jared Fogel, uh, who was the spokesperson for Subway, who was kind of their oh, marketing guy, the big fat guy that yeah, lost he, a lot of weight. Yeah, yeah he yeah, lost yeah. a lot of weight and yeah. he kind of went around with his like pants and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. 
um, it was found out that he was engaging in sexual assaults of children, um, and he was trading child sexual abuse material, um, and he went to prison for it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was beloved, and he talked openly about mm-hmm. how his favorite part of what he does is getting to work with kids. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, wanted to get them get them young. And there are all these recorded phone calls where um, a woman who was working ultimately on behalf of law enforcement, um, where he's talking to her about the things that he likes and about how he liked girls that were middle schoolers and he called them hot and things like that. I mean, it was just really hard to listen to mm-hmm. that stuff. But he was so open about how he had this interest in young children Mm -hmm. and wanted access to them. Like he even, I think in one of the phone calls and Stephanie Harlow is a YouTuber who just recently did a uh, YouTube series about Jared Vogel. And that's where I heard a lot of this stuff. Um, at least reheard it. Mm -hmm. I'm a true crime junkie, despite the fact that I had spent my whole day doing it. So was my wife. My wife's a Uh, true crime junkie too. (laughs) It's a problem, (laughs) but she talked a lot about, or she played some of these phone calls and um, where he asks her if if she would be comfortable letting him see her kids naked. And they were, I think, like 9 and 10 or mm-hmm. very young children. And you know, she just had to play along and be like, well, sure. Mm. Because she was trying to get yeah. information for the police. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, that, that was somebody who had a very positive public image. He mm. went all over the media. He did interviews with all of these people. Mm-hmm. And this is the kind of person that he ultimately turned out to be. Yeah. There was a series on, on Netflix called cheer and Jerry Harris, who was one of the most beloved people in that series. He was really famous for what they call Matt talk, where he was really encouraging to his teammates, you know, screaming for them and telling them how great they were doing. And then it came out that he was soliciting explicit Mm -hmm. images of teenage boys. And he ended up, I believe going to federal prison for, Mm -hmm child pornography charges Mm -hmm. and so it's it's really easy for people like that to have this culture of enabling around them all you have to do is look at r kelly Mm -hmm. i mean he is somebody that has just now been convicted for all of these things and he spent years Mm -hmm. doing this stuff Mm -hmm. you have a lot of women who have detailed their experiences with him and how awful it was Mm -hmm. and how they bought into the whole celebrity aspect of it that, Mm -hmm. you know, it's R. Kelly. He's incredibly talented as a musician. He was a very attractive man. He had all this money. He had all these groupies, this entourage, and a lot of people were enabling him Mm -hmm. to continue abusing these women. Mm -hmm. And, it's it's really easy for that enabling to continue. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't want to believe that someone they know could be like this. Mm-hmm. They don't want to believe that someone they know could be a predator. And Yeah, there's another Netflix documentary about a guy, a guy called Jimmy Savile who mm-hmm. was like big when I was a kid in, in, in England, you know, and he did this show called Jim Will Fix It where he took kids and he made their dreams come true, you know, and he was an absolute monster. Yeah. Um, and he was enabled by the BBC and it was hidden and it was, you know, d- 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 because he was making them a lot of money. Yeah. Um, it, it, freaking disgusting. How bad is this problem? Is it rampant or is it somewhat isolated i mean one case is too many but I, on the on the scale of i mean it's a very difficult question to answer right but how many things come across your desk generally so cyber the cyber tip line has handled over i believe 52 million online cyber tips since its inception wow um you know during certain years, there would be one million new cyber tips a month. Mm-hmm. And every new cyber tip is an image being shared. And they have a database of what they call known images. Um, images that by uh, the hash value, which is kind of like a, the easiest way to explain it is kind of a digital fingerprint, where it's, it's a unique identifier of a certain image. And if anything important about that image changes, that hash value will change. So they have these, what they call known images. There are certain series that are very well known. Um, There are certain survivors that are very well known um, because these these series have been traded 
dozens and dozens of mm. times on a daily basis. Um, we get a lot of those. That's kind of our average case of the the uploaded images that are known. Mm. Um, sometimes we'll get what mm. is called a priority one cyber tip, which is a live child being in danger in that moment. Mm. Um, and those go to our investigators. We work with incredible investigators um, who they do incredible work and they do the hardest work. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, my husband is in law enforcement and I always tell people there is no amount of money you could offer me to be mm -hmm. in law enforcement. I can't do it. Yeah. I know that I can't do it because I've worked with the law, with the police mm -hmm. for so long and it's, it's just, I can't do it. And I know that I can't they're, do they're, it. They're freaking unsung heroes. They really are. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, uh, they're the last line of defense. I've, I've tremendous respect for law enforcement. I really do. What they do every single day is incredible. And they're, they're underpaid, they're overworked, they're scrutinized, they're, they're politicized. It, it, it's it's a horrible job. Yeah. And, and if you're a law enforcement out there, you guys are my heroes. You're, you're doing great work, but you're doing great work. I couldn't do what you do. I couldn't. Um, it, it's got a way on you to be dealing with these freaking monsters yeah. um, all yeah. the time. It's it's yeah. tough because, I mean, in, in March of, I believe, 2018, uh, two studies came out. Um, and they found a few things. One, that girls primarily are depicted in these images. Mm -hmm. um, and that, by and large, they're prepubescent girls. Mm -hmm. um, and boys are depicted in these images. And the ones that are depicted are generally younger than the girls that are depicted. Mm -hmm. um, they are more likely to not have reached puberty mm -hmm. by the time they're depicted in these images. Um, the the trade of these images out in the open has happened a lot and there is a lot of a lot of people who believe that maybe posting things like a picture of their kids in their bathing suits or a video of their baby in the bathtub is completely innocent and god I wish that it was mm. but unfortunately in my experience it's not mm. i have found fi photos like that among photos of children being sexually assaulted in collections of, of child predators. Mm -hmm. They're not as innocent as you think. And what is an innocent, sweet video to you mm -hmm. is something else entirely to somebody who sees your child as mm -hmm. an object. Yeah. And, and the unfortunate reality is that there is no minimum age for some mm -hmm. interests. There are people who... They they mm. are interested in very very young babies. Mm -hmm. There was, I believe, Blake Lively a few years ago gave a um, gave a talk at a some kind of function, and she was talking about how she had spoken to an investigator who handles these cases, and she asked, "How old was the youngest victim you've ever seen?" And he said, "The umbilical cord was still attached." Oh my god! I mean, it's it is really mm. it's truly horrific. It's truly horrific stuff. Correct me if I'm wrong. And you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but <laughs> the people who do this, they don't get re rehabilitated, right? They are always a threat. I mean, it's there are a lot of different studies out there about mm -hmm. how, you know, there are certain tests that you can perform to test whether or not they are a high risk or low risk for recidivism. Um, but as a prosecutor, I, I look at things as what the, the rules of professional conduct call a minister of justice. That's what they call being a prosecutor. And so I don't go into a courtroom looking for a win, necessarily. Mm -hmm. I go into a courtroom seeking justice, mm -hmm. and that's my job, and that's what I love about being a prosecutor. And sometimes justice doesn't mean they go to prison for life. Sometimes justice means they get a lot of counseling, and they mm -hmm. spend some time on probation, they spend some time on the sex offender registry, and because that comes with certain consequences. Mm -hmm. And... There are, you know, people who are able to walk out in the world and be productive citizens and still live on the sex offender registry, but they have to make a choice mm -hmm. to be somebody who wants to be a productive member of society. They mm -hmm. have to be somebody who wants to actively make change. Mm -hmm. And there are some people that just aren't interested because they don't see what they're doing as wrong. The... Um Let's talk about advice for parents. Yeah. Okay. Um, give me a couple of things that you will do. And that, like when, when your, your little boy is older, things yeah. will have changed again, yeah. right? Yeah. So right now, if he was 12, right, 13, mm -hmm. what would you do in, in the realm of realism? 
knowing yeah. that it's the world we live in now and we have to learn to to, to live among technology yeah unless you want to be amish and go live yeah. in, live in pennsylvania which god bless them might be the way to go but yeah. but what would you do now as a mom, it's hard because I, I'm, you know, I'm a mom, but I'm also a millennial. I grew up with yeah. social mm-hmm. media. So I you have a better understanding with, of it than I would, right? With, because I, I had nothing until a couple of years ago yeah. until I got out of the military. But, um, yeah, what would you do? I would have a very real conversation with him. And, I mean, obviously you have to be age appropriate. Mm-hmm. And you have to also know your kids. Mm-hmm. You have to know kind of where they are. You have to know who they're hanging out with. You have to know what their interests are, Mm -hmm. but be engaged with them. If they're playing Fortnite, say, okay, well, I'd love to spend 30 minutes playing with you once a week Mm -hmm. because that will expose you to the things that they are seeing when they're playing these games. They'll expose you to the people that they're engaging with Mm -hmm. or not. I mean, some kids get on there and they turn off the chat function and they just want to get in the zone and play. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And explain to your children in an age-appropriate way, listen, there are people out here that don't have your best interests at heart and that you never truly know who you're talking to on the other end of this computer or the other end of this phone or whatever it is. And educate them about things like there are websites like Omegle that's been around since I was a kid where it's just you get online and you are it's like a web chat and a a video chat where you are matched with randomly a just a person and a lot a lot of the material that I see is like screenshots from Omegle Omegle yeah okay where like there was a case um, I believe it happened in 2012 uh, I believe she was 15 at the time. Amanda Todd was her name. Um, She committed suicide because she was being extorted for images of herself. She had been talking to this one guy for a long time, Mm -hmm. and he'd been begging for photos and videos. And one day she did give him what he wanted, and he screenshotted it on the webcam Mm -hmm. stream and proceeded to extort her for more and more and more and say, if you don't send me this, I'll show it to your family. If you don't send me this, I'll post it online. Mm-hmm. And she ended up killing herself as a result of that. Mm-hmm. We had a case very recently in South Carolina where a young man killed himself mm-hmm. because he was being extorted for images wow. online. And it is so important for parents to know who your kids are talking to. It is it is your responsibility as a parent to be in their business. Do it in a way that is respectful and don't just come at them with because I said so because I can tell you like at the age of 13 and 14 that was the last thing I cared about the last Mm -hmm. thing I wanted to hear about I don't care what you say because at the age of 13 I know everything you you cannot tell me anything Mm -hmm. it's only gotten worse as I got older Mm -hmm. although like I asked my mom everything now but (laughs) but at that age you have to explain to them like listen I know that you think that you know everything and that's fine probably do know a lot but there are things that you don't know. Mm-hmm. And it is my job as your mom to protect you. Mm-hmm. And it is my job to make sure that you stay safe and that you are equipped when you grow up and go out in the world on your own to take care of yourself. And you need to know that sometimes people are dangerous. Sometimes these apps that people enjoy looking at aren't really the best for you one of the biggest problems so i'm from ireland my wife's from sweden so we grew up in europe so it wasn't that sleepover as a kid was not Mm -hmm. a thing right probably because all the parents that the kids that i hung around all had a dozen kids they didn't want any more at the house right so there was no sleepover but my daughters wanted to sleep over at a friend's house that was not something we were comfortable with right and number one my wife knows the mom doesn't know the dad or the mom's divorced and the step or the, the, the stepdad's there or the boyfriend or I don't know him, right? Mm-hmm. And the consequences for us for being wrong was just too dire. And we wouldn't allow it for a long, long time. But being overprotective like that is not a great strategy either, right? You have to find a balance yeah. because a lot, a lot of kids that get, would you say, uh, strict parents? Strict parents make sneaky kids. Make sneaky kids, right, yeah. Um, so I... I, I our kids are great, so I think we struck that balance okay, but um, we were not okay with that. 
because yeah. that's an environment where we have lost control mm -hmm. of the situation, right? Yeah. And now it's 10 times worse because it happens in your own house, yeah. in, in, in your daughter or son's room, and, and you think it's innocent. It is a freaking scary world. Yeah. It really is. God bless you for what you do. You really are. I mean, that that is because somebody has to do it, right? And, um, yeah, the... Um, Okay. Any more? Any more tips for parents other than that? I mean, you wouldn't. I mean, I I would. I don't know. I I say I would, but I didn't. Yeah. I I because I don't know. My daughter has an Instagram account, but she's like twenty two now. Yeah. But, um, but she almost never posts on it. I I, I just you find male young men and women too. They grow up with this thing where they're fed by these likes mm -hmm. and comments and they need to get it's like yeah. a drug almost right it's an endor yeah. uh, endorphin freaking uh, uh, release yeah. and they they have seen it where people's lives are collapsing around them and they will not give it up I, i've seen people yeah. where their marriage is collapsing around them and they will not give it up because yeah. they need that feed mm -hmm. and they're probably been at it since they were kids right yeah. since they were uh, at this day and age yeah. um it's a it's a very very dangerous thing if you yeah. lose control like anything like yeah. alcohol like all kinds of stuff yeah. right um just be responsible yeah. be responsible are there any resources out there for for guidance that you know of yeah so the national center for missing and exploited children has something called the net smarts program um it's n-e-t-s-m-a-r-t-z it's on their website missingkids.org mm -hmm. um and it's geared towards ch children and they have you know different age brackets in it is an educational resource to educate kids about internet safety. Mm -hmm. And there are aspects of it that are for the parents, for them to review and learn about internet safety for themselves and how to keep their kids safe online. Mm -hmm. Because the issue isn't access to the internet, the issue is unfettered access right. to the internet. If if your kids go on Instagram and have no, no parental controls whatsoever, I can almost guarantee you that they are going to be targeted. Mm. I mean, it is it is almost a given. Can't you? I mean, you may not know, but I think you can set up an Instagram account that is uh, parental controlled, uh, where you there can, are certain I ways think to do there's it. There's ways to do it, yeah. And there are also a lot of people. The minimum age for like an Instagram account or for Facebook, I believe, is thirteen. Mm. I think that's too young. I do my, too. My opinion is that's way too young. Yeah, and they'll just lie anyway. You can make it and eighteen. And it is possible and just to lie. lie. Yeah, and it, it it's. Yeah. It's hard, like I said, it's hard to strike that balance of mm. how do I keep my kids safe without being a helicopter parent. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody has to determine that for themselves. But ultimately, it's about respecting your kids enough to say, listen, you're a smart kid. Mm -hmm. Here is why this is so dangerous. Because everybody, like I said, wants to believe that it couldn't happen to them. Yeah. And that it absolutely can. I yeah. mean, I know people that it's happened to, mm. that their images are just out there mm. and they can never get them back. The internet is forever. Mm -hmm. And once it's once it's out there, it is impossible yeah. to get it back. And, and just uh, like for parents that know, if you post kids, if you post pictures of your daughter or your son out there, it may end up on, on some freaking pedophile website, right? Um, because you, yeah. It's so scary. It really is. It is. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much for coming in. And uh, I, I would love to do some sort of webinar or mm -hmm. like a, like a, a an event sometime for yeah. if you'd be open to it for parents to come and, and, and kind of get kind of guidance from you. Yeah. And and because I I, I just. They need to ed be educated so yeah. they can protect their kids. There's absolutely there's yeah. there's no more thing important thing for a parent is, is the, the the welfare of their child. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll go ahead and throw out the normal lawyer disclaimers of yes. I'm a lawyer, but yeah. I'm not your lawyer. Yeah. Uh, anything yeah. that I've said here is mm -hmm. not to be construed as legal advice. There you go. Hire competent counsel if you need legal advice, and also any opinions are mine and mine alone. Um, I have been in this field for. A long time mm -hmm. but I have also been on the internet for a good portion of my life I'm mm -hmm. gonna be 38 this year and I got my first AOL account when I was 10 years old and 
in that time, I have learned that the internet is what you make it. You know, my generation got to the place where we all kind of got addicted to social media. I mean, Facebook came around when I was in college. Mm. We all had MySpace before, you know, we, who was in our top eight? That was like the biggest concern that we had mm -hmm. when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And now it is everywhere. TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and all of these things. And even Pinterest is making a comeback, which I think is odd. But I've also noticed that Gen Z, kind of this younger generation in like their teens and in their early 20s, they are stepping away from technology in a way that my generation didn't. Really? They are, there is a rise in the sale of what they're calling dumb phones, mm. which are like flip phones, just yeah. not smartphones that you yeah. can't access the internet with. Mm -hmm. And they're, because they're recognizing that, I believe they said that Gen Z, uh, something like 47% of Gen Zers identify as having a diagnosed mental illness. And, and that's, that's really sad. That's an, a sharp increase from mm -hmm. other generations. And I think it's because they've grown up with Instagram. They've grown up with Snapchat. They've grown up with these, these platforms where a certain body type is idealized, a certain persona mm -hmm. is idealized. And they feel like if they don't look like that, if they don't talk mm -hmm. like that, if they don't act like that, if they don't do their makeup that way, then they have something to fix about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think they're realizing now that, that's a really dangerous way to live yeah, your you're life. You're comparing your real life to somebody else's fake life. Exactly. Like, it's just all fake, yeah. Everybody's posting their highlight reels yeah, on exactly. social media. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and that's all well and good. That's great for you. But, mm -hmm. you know, recognize that social media is not real. And especially with these cases where you have these people that are going online and pretending to be a 17-year-old boy when they're a 45-year-old man. Mm-hmm you never truly know who you're talking to unless it's really your friend. And even then, I mean, when I was prosecuting in North Carolina, I would have like cyber stalking cases. And the hardest thing to prove was, well, you don't know that my client sent that message to you. You don't, you weren't watching them send that message. So even though it you? came from their IP address. They, and even yeah. if it, because I can't put them right. holding the phone. Yeah. But there was a case that came out a while ago that basically said like, um, if you can identify how they talk normally in text messages mm. and they're talking differently, mm. then you can guess maybe it's somebody mm -hmm. different, but there are ways to kind of identify the person. But you know, typically people don't send pictures of themselves alongside, you know, pornographic images mm -hmm. if they're not themselves doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, it's really hard because technology is so ingrained in our society and especially with, schools having gone virtual for the bulk of you know 2020 yeah. and 2021 mm -hmm. it's impossible to keep your kids away from the internet completely yep unless you homeschool them and do all of these things to really keep them away from it mm -hmm. but i i, I think your, your job as a parent is to prepare your kids for the yeah. world not protect them exactly. from the world right because so, ultimately they're going to grow up and they're going to go out yeah. in the world mm -hmm. and they're going to need to know how to handle themselves in a way that they can keep themselves safe because ultimately, and as a mom, this is really hard mm -hmm. for me to acknowledge, I can't always protect my son. No. And as much as I would love to keep him in a bubble, mm -hmm. I can't. Yeah. And he needs to be a man who can stand on his own two feet and mm -hmm. who can protect himself if, it, if that need ever arises. Mm -hmm. And I think that hopefully his dad and I do a great job of, mm -hmm. of putting him in a, the best possible position to do that. But at the end of the day, Kids are going to make their own decisions, and they're going to do what they, they're going to do what they're going to do. And you just have to hope that as a parent, you <coughs> you prepare them for that, yeah. and you you raise them God, to it. make good decisions the, at that point, right? Because it's out of your hands. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the important thing is, if your kids do something stupid, yeah, don't be judgmental. Don't come at them with, "Well, I told you that was going to happen," because all that's going to do is make them close off completely, mm -hmm. and they're, you're never going to hear from that kid again about something like this. Yeah. Say, you know what? You did a dumb thing, but here's what we're going to do about it. Mm -hmm. And if your child is being contacted by someone that you don't know online, call the police. Okay. Go to law enforcement. Keep those messages. Block the account, but don't delete yours. Mm. Don't delete the posts. Because some 
electronic service providers and some applications will preserve certain things even if you delete it. Most won't. Mm. So if it is deleted by the user, it is gone. Okay. And so things like Snapchat, there are ways that they can preserve those images. There are ways that they can preserve those videos. Don't delete the account because law enforcement will need to be able to access that later. Okay, that's great advice. Yeah, yeah. I, I this is going to go on on uh, my podcast, but it's also going to go on YouTube. And if people have questions and they want to, they don't want to put it in a public forum. You can mm-hmm. you can message me directly, and I will ask you. I'll, yeah. I'll push it to you if I, yeah. if I have any particular because some people don't want to ask questions. I think that's a great place to leave it. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it's a difficult subject to talk it's, about, but yeah. it's so important. It's so important, our, our especially are, especially nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, and it's getting worse. I assume yeah. every every year, every month. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing thank this. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, guys. Until the next time. Thank you. Bye.